Okay. Yes. This is a huge screen. <laughs> really. <laughs> okay. Let's go on. We don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. We don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents, kept saying Bob Ross. Uh, he was the host of a Joy of Painting, um, a TV show uh, where he was painting live for 30 minutes, always using some color palette, always painting a new piece from scratch in 30 minutes. And for years on, he showed that anyone with a bit of practice and an enthusiastic approach can create something beautiful, um, something that seemed impossible at first. And Bob Ross is a great in uh, inspiration to me. My name is Matthew Henry. <laughs> I go on NSP01. Um, I work for Microsoft, where I am a software engineer. Um, and I have a background in demo scene, and I run a code club since about two years. Uh, we, we'll go through the talk of through the next 30 ish minutes in that order, talking about work, about the demo scene, the code club, then some live coding, and then we'll close on a happy note before going to the party. Um, so, about Microsoft. Uh, I joined about three years ago, uh, and after, before that, uh, I was working for Opera Software, the web browser, for more than 10 years. Uh, so it was really scary to join a big company. Uh, but I've only met really nice and really smart people, so uh, the, the transition was really good, and much better than I expected. Um, my team uh, works on the profile card uh, in that you can see in Outlook and Office 365. So on the slides, you can see three flavors of a card. Uh, you can see the small version uh, in the middle of the screen, the big extended version uh, that takes half of the screen, and the mobile version. Uh, we, we have more than 100 million users, more than 100 active contributors. Uh, it's like 150 total. Uh, we have a monorepo with 80-ish packages. We ship uh, on six platforms, and we, we are essentially, or the profile card is essentially a third-party component, which is uh, used, bootstrapped in more than 25 workloads. So there's a lot that goes on uh, into shipping one third-party component into 25 workloads. Uh, so today, uh, Emily, Wolfgang, Heidi talked about a lot about uh, scaling teams, processes, and uh, services. So this is all familiar now to you. Uh, there's a lot that goes on into the quality and testing, uh, something which is important because we ship uh, on six platforms. We ship on iOS, Android, Windows, Mac, UWP, and the web from IE11 and up. Uh, we use TypeScript and native languages. More than three quarters of the code is shared across all platforms. We compiled on all of these platforms. And by far, uh, I know it's a web conference, but by far, the web is the most hostile. Any of the workloads that we are bootstrapped in can inject JavaScript or CSS that will break our experience. Or worse, any JavaScript or CSS that you inject can break any of these 25 workloads. We don't want to break Office 365 or Outlook. Um, so there's a lot going on about testing and ensuring quality. Uh, also. This is Microsoft. We have consumer, business, and government uh, customers. Compliance is number one priority. We, we have to make sure that no user data is stored longer than it needs to, and that all user data, all data, is stored within the compliance mandatory. Some, uh, some countries, even for consumer data, require that all data remains in the border of the country. And for governments, you can imagine that it's even more complicated. Um, so we have a lot of telemetry in place to make sure that the service uh, goes and to know when and where things break. We installed uh, shield rotation, uh, which is uh, basically a site reliability engineering. My team, uh, the core team of the profile card, we are 10 people now. And for two weeks, one of the engineers is like in charge of the service, in charge of monitoring that everything goes on, uh, takes the calls, mitigate incidents and so on, and uh, runs the service review where we check that we meet all the, all the SLOs uh, that uh, we saw before. And, and this rotation of uh, having a shield or SRE, 
uh, is really great because we are 10, so there's only one person that is in charge of like shielding everybody else so that everybody else can focus on feature work. And this one person is leveling, leveling up. Like, that way, the whole team learns how the service runs. And so it's really a good, a good practice. Uh, so this is how we run the service in a nutshell. And you can see that Bob Ross adage about uh, uh, we don't make mistakes, we have happy accidents, doesn't work here. Uh, we are only humans. We do make mistakes, and many people are impacted when we do. But we learn from our mistakes. Uh, we run what we call root cause analysis. Uh, so we, when an incident happens, we mitigate as soon as possible. Then we understand, we fix, and we prevent uh, the same incident from happening ever again. Uh, so we, we do make mistakes, but we learn from them, and we, we prevent them. So this is more or less how we do uh, things at work. Uh, now moving on, um, I said that I have a background with Demoscene. And the demo scene was born in the early 80s in Berlin. Uh, it started with this image of a Berlin bear in front of a pirated software. Uh, it, was, it was nothing special. It was just a statement. But this statement uh, started a whole movement where people started to push the artistic and, uh, tec or artistic and technical boundaries of uh, any platform. Nowadays, the demo scene is very alive. Uh, there are many competitions and events like this one throughout the years. And people use the most modern and also the most ancient platforms to, to express themselves, to make art uh, with that. Um, I was exposed to the demo scene very early, but I really got hooked when I got an Atari ST. Uh, here you can see the uh, operating system of the Atari in its full glory, 320 pixels by 216 colors. Um, and this resolution that I just mentioned, like 320, 200, and 16 colors, uh, you can see the full extent in the menu bar at the top and the green uh, thing on the side, oh, in the background. I would like you to pay attention to the green part and especially the bottom. So the green part is the whole resolution. Is you cannot, that's all you can draw. If you look at the bottom in the green part, these people managed to draw some text outside of the boundaries of the hardware. When I saw this demo, I was hooked. I was like, I have to understand how this works. I want to do that too. And watching demos and t from that day until today is my joy of painting. I, I watch demos all the time, and I, I have to understand how they work. Uh, so later, when I moved to the web, I also try to do things outside the box. Um, so here you see Defender with Five Icon. Uh, it's a remake of Defender, the old arcade game that I made to play inside the icon of the web page. Uh, so the whole game happens in the web, in the icon. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. <laughs> so pl platform and size uh, limits are really fun to work with. Um, and I especially like size limits, because that really limits the scope of a project and also limits the amount of time that I need to spend on it, because I have a full-time job, I have family, and yeah, I guess there's only so much time for fun stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. This is my type of fun. Anyways. Uh, my favorite thing nowadays is to do uh, as much as I can in one kilobyte. Um, this thing that I call matraca. Uh, where is my cursor? Oh, yeah, I see it. Uh, careful with the ears. Okay, the sound. And this whole thing is one kilobyte. Okay. Uh, and I also like to do things in 256 bytes. You, you can do a lot with that. Uh, it's not much code, but it's also cool because then it doesn't take too long to make. Uh, I, I like to do visuals, but I also like to do sound. Uh, because it's really fun, and because I'm not a really good musician, <laughs> so I get to try. Uh, and here's an homage that I made to uh, Music for Airport from Brian Eno in 256 bytes. Uh, if you like that, uh, I gave a talk explaining how I did this at the Web Audio Conference in Berlin a few months ago. 
And finally, one of my last uh, production is called Voltra. And I will try. So the sound is not for everybody, but I just want to put it anyways. Not for everybody, the sound. Uh, but this thing was really designed to be played for a demo scene competition in a huge arena with like 4,000 people. Like I really wanted to make the whole shakes. Um, and it's one kilobyte, but it's like uses CSS 3D, Canvas, uh, Web Audio, uh, and the Synthesis API. It was really fun to make. Uh, so as you can imagine, there's uh, a lot of trial and error that goes into making uh, demo scene productions. And like, what Bob Ross says, we don't make mistakes, we have happy accidents, is especially true here. Uh, often we have uh, happy accidents or happy bugs that turn into something much better than we, we anticipated. Uh, and I, I was partially introduced to the demo scene uh, when I was a kid and I was going to a code club when I was six, seven years old. Uh, and I owe a lot to that code club. Uh, so, two years ago, I decided to open one at the school of my daughter with children from 7 to 11, 12 years old. Uh, we meet every Tuesday after school. Um, and at the beginning, we, uh, when we introduce new concepts, we, we do exercises on paper, and it's really fun. On the first class, I even give them Legos to build a maze and then to write some, write some code to escape the maze. So it's, it's really fun. Um, when we move on to... To code, uh, I chose the Pico 8, which is a fantasy console. So it's, uh, it's like an emulator for a console that does not exist, that was uh, invented by uh, Joseph White, called Zep, uh, on Twitter. It's very limited, like her screen is 128 square, 16 colors, there's sprites, a very limited API. Uh, and it's very, it's very compact, it's really cozy. Uh, and it comes with a text editor, with a sprite editor, maps, sound, and music. It's really cool to, to work with. Uh, and I really like to also not only talk about code or about uh, programs, how to think. I also like to introduce uh, the children to like to amazing people that have contributed to the field of computer science or that do just cool stuff with uh, computers. So some of these people might be familiar to you. <laughs> um, and one of these people is uh, Samia Alabi. Uh, she's 81 years old. She's an accomplished painter, she's a teacher, and a creative coder. So nowadays, she's 81, 82 years old. When she was 50, she bought a, a Commodore Amiga 1000. That was back in the 84, 85. She taught herself how to code in C and basic because she wanted to express herself, to make art with code. She was like, this is a cool new medium. I want to do stuff. Uh, so she did. And uh, I don't have an Amiga or an emulator setup. Uh, but for the kids, I, I introduced them to one piece made by Samia Halabi called Rain. Here I remade it on Pico 8. So you can see the code is it's very small. It's a uh, it's really basic concept. Just draw random lines and have something that sweeps around. It's really simple, but it's beautiful, and it's nice. So I asked the kids to, like, to re reinterpret it. Uh, so here's Rain, reinterpreted by Nicolas, 10 years old. It's cool. It's perfect. This kid almost never wrote a line of code before. And here's Rain, uh, reinterpreted by Leo, 10 years old. And if we reset... Doot, doot. Yeah, I really like it. Uh, and more recently, we started to... Uh, to make games, so I wanted to, I thought, what, what is a simple game that we could make together? So I, I made a Tron or Snake game, uh, so this is what I, what I did and what I showed them, and explained basically how it works. And this is what they did. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. It looks so, so cool. <laughs> they, they just came up with that. And, and look at what this, uh, this kid did. 
I don't know about you, but I want to play this. <laughs> yeah. So at the code club, there's no one makes mistakes. We don't make mistakes. We just, we just have happy accidents. We create. We're having fun, making cool stuff. Uh, so you, you saw three sides of me, uh, three things that I like to do. And another thing that, uh, that I like to do, uh, which is a scary, I don't know really why I do it. Oh, yes, I do, um, is to live code. Uh, so today, I would like to do something a bit like Voltra, uh, the, the production that I showed you with uh, text characters flipping a bit in 3D with a like, really gritty sound. I will not do the sound today, uh, but I will do some visuals similar to that. Um, and this is not like about me like doing something like, ooh, I'm awesome. This is about, let's see what we can do with the platform. Let's see, let's have fun with the platform. Uh, so I just need to, uh, da -da -da -da. sorry. Just a little bit of setup to switch the screen. Yes. I duplicate my screen. Yeah, that's all good. Sorry. <laughs> Take. Eleven. Uh, for this to be a bit less boring, <laughs> uh, I will just put some background music. Uh, f uh, this is generative.fm. It's it's a bit like uh, this homage that I did to uh, music for airports uh, in JavaScript. Uh, this is made by Alex Bainter. All the music are in MIT license, so it's all cool to play now. And it's really cool. Uh, it's just to have some ambient music. OK. So now we have my concern. So uh, I will talk this guy, take this one. Is the text big enough? OK, cool. Right, so uh, because the, the visual theme of, um, of all these animations was about space and things like that, I, I thought that I would show some stars and that it would be nice. Uh, so I have some images of stars or things like this. Uh, but I will show together. Um, let's do this. So here I have just VS Code open with a plain file. Uh, so an HTML page that loads the CSS and all my images and a canvas at the end. Uh, in the style sheet, I have a radial gradient in the background. Uh, I set the perspective uh, for the 3D transforms uh, that I preserve. And then I position the body and all its children to the center and to be like a uh, wide scale, so uh, like a two by one ratio. Uh, oh, let me bring back some outlines. Okay, so you see these outlines. Uh, so now you see that uh, the images, we have an animation called zoom in, and if I and comment it. Uh, we, we see that all the images are moving towards us, but they are moving together. They are all stacked on top of each other. Uh, so to make them really, like to build multiple layers of stars that move towards us and then come back, uh, I just need to add an animation delay on the CSS animation that moves them on the Z, uh, Z axis here. So now adding an animation delay on the images, I save, reload. Now we have eight layers of stars and uh, gas clouds moving towards us. Um, and it's cool like this, but we can also tilt the whole thing in 3D uh, by moving the whole body. Uh, so here I'm uncomment uncommenting the tilt animation on the body. What it does is uh, translate back to the middle and then it applies a rotation against the x-axis. So the x-axis is horizontal, so things will move like this. 
uh, also against the y-axis. Y-axis is like this, so it will tilt like this. And sometimes against the z, like this, uh, at different uh, timings of percentages. So if I command, like things like really tilt in 3D smoothly. So we have like a nice setup, and let's remove the uh, colorful outlines that are not giving us much. OK. Yeah. So now we can start to code, and it's time for me to pop out my notes, because otherwise I will be completely lost. <laughs> uh, so uh, first thing we will do is uh, we have a canvas, and we will draw on the canvas. So first, I need to get the canvas. Selector canvas. I need to get the context of that canvas. And I will create a, 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 a render frame method uh, that will get the time now. And I will call this render frame uh, with initial time of zero. And then I call it with request animation frame. Up. And what I can do, I can set uh, fill style to white so we can see it. We'll display the time now at zero, zero. Mm, nothing happened, and nothing happened because by default the canvas uh, draws above. When you give a coordinate, it draws above. Uh, so I need to set the uh, the baseline of my canvas. Text baseline will be from the top, and also just because uh, I also want the alignment to be centered. Voilà. Uh, yeah, so we see the text, except that I don't clear it. Uh, but at least our render, render loop works. Uh, I want, like, Voltra, the, uh, the thing that I'm trying to redo somehow here, uh, draws text. Uh, there are multiple columns and rows of text, so I need to define how many columns and rows I want. Um, I'll go for uh, 64 columns and 32 rows, and then I can, in my render loop, uh, set the width of a canvas to be a uh, number of columns. I will add, I will give myself one extra row on each side and one extra uh, column on each side to have a bit of buffer, uh, to not draw things too close to the edges. And the default size of a text is 10. Uh, So now, so now that should clear the screen. Perfect. Okay. Now let's instead of drawing uh, the time, let's let's draw characters on the whole grid. Uh, so we we'll start from y uh, zero to the number of rows. Okay, and now we can do. Um, let's do one. Let's pick. A, let's do that. A character X. Oh, okay. A random character. And we will display this guy at uh, the X coordinate times 10. I add one because I want to give myself one column and one row of buffer. So I will do the same for the Y coordinate. Uh, go away. Okay. So now we have a whole grid of random characters. Uh, 
that, that's cool, but we can, uh, I would like something a bit less random. Uh, so I will be the list of characters. And I will do. Let's say I will use maximum number of characters that I have of columns. So cars plus equal a string from car code. Uh, and I would like to display some cool characters, not just letters. Uh, and the UTF-8 block uh, or Unicode block uh, or the block elements looks pretty cool. So we'll use all the, all the characters from there, from X2580 and forward. So X2580 plus I. And there I will display in my field text the card there, X. And I can close this guy. So now we see all the characters. Um, OK. That's neat. Uh, but I would like to be able to change the, the character that I display. Uh, and I can do something like get a character index. That would be x plus, let's use the time. I don't know. The time is in milliseconds, so divided by 600 milliseconds. So it gives something cool. And then I can do const the current characters. Uh, and now I can do. And uh, 63 is to get an uh, integral number between 0 and 63. And I can just display that character. So nothing changed, except that now the characters are moving horizontally, because I uh, added the time now to the character. And I also like to add a bit of glitch. And the glitch it can be as simple as uh, just a random number uh, between zero, uh, 0 and 1.1. .1. So anything above 1 will be like glitchy. So we can add the glitch to the character index. So we should, OK, 1.1 .1 is too much. Let's do 1001. It glitches a little bit. We can do even less. OK. So sorry for the sniffle. This is bad. Uh, now I would like to draw a pattern. Um, and we can start. Sorry. Um, we can start with a simple pattern. Um, let's use the the color for that. Um, okay, we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, what I would like to show is. A pattern based on the x and y coordinate. Uh, so we can do const pattern equal. Let's use our good friends uh, the uh, binary XOR, uh, and we can do if a pattern and one and one, uh, meaning if that pattern x XOR y uh, is zero or one in binary, then we will do something. Uh, uh, we can do. We can pass a list of colors. We can pass transparent and yeah, something purplish. So now every, uh, it's not obvious, uh, every second character like makes like a checkboard pattern. Uh, but it's like, it has a very tight resolution, so we can add a scale. Uh, I can do a zoom ratio. Is Let's start at eight. Let's do eight. Uh, and we can do x2 is x divided by the zoom. And x y2 is y divided by zoom. So now we have a bigger pattern. And one pattern is cool, but I would like to have more. Uh, so what I can do is define a set of patterns using over mathematical formulas. Uh, so we can use uh, like modulo, uh, the, uh, the binary or to combine the bits together. And 
the binary AND. So now we have a set of patterns, but we only check one. And I can do const pattern uh, equals from our patterns. Uh, we will pick uh, something based, let's say, on the time divided by every second. We will change pattern and and three uh, to get only the number zero, one, two, and three. So now every every second we should change pattern. Two, two, two. Cool. Uh, so I want these patterns to move. Uh, so for that, let's go back to slides. And in the demo scene, there's this thing that we call a roto zoom. Uh, it's basically something that rotates and zoom, hence the name. Uh, so if you look at uh, the coordinate of this point, one, zero, x is one, y is zero. When you don't change anything, it looks like this in the in a transformation matrix. And for the coordinate zero, one, so just the y axis, it looks like this in the matrix. So you have. I will talk about the blue one. Uh, so you, when you don't change anything, you have one time x plus zero time y. If you scale for the x-axis, you have w time x and zero times y. If you rotate by an angle phi, the x coordinate becomes x time the cosinus phi minus y, y times the sinus phi, and the y coordinate becomes x times sinus phi plus y times cosinus phi. OK. Yeah. But this is what we're going to do now. Uh, so I, I just need to pick an angle. Uh, let's use the time now divided by something very slow at the beginning. Let's compute the cos. Sinus. Now, instead of doing just this, my bad, uh, I, I will also uh, add the zoom level to this cos and sin. So now I can say that the x is x time, or the rotated x, or transformed x is x time cos minus y times the sinus, and the y is y times cos plus x times, sorry, sin plus y times cos. This is really what we see here. So now what it looks like is hopefully things are starting to spin around. And just to move them a bit from the center, I can just do plus 4.5, and that will move around. Uh, now, the characters look cool, but I think they would be even cooler if they are a bit shiny. Uh, so we can add some kind of bloom. Uh, bloom is basically like make things glow. And there is this new cool thing on Canvas where you can apply uh, CSS filters. Uh, so we just apply a blur or say four pixels. Then we draw the canvas onto itself and we reset the, the blur to zero pixels. So now the characters should look shiny. I don't know. Should be shiny. Okay. Let's make it a lot. Moving on. Uh, in Voltra, maybe you noticed, but there was some kind of patterns in the background. Uh, I will make this one transparent. Uh, and these patterns that were behind these shapes rotating, uh, they are called, uh, or they look like this, and they are called elementary cellular automata. Uh, it's just a bit like the game of life. So. You look at a grid of cells, like you look at each rose, and to know how one cell will look like in the next generation, you look at the, the neighbors or at the cell and its neighbors. So you look at 
current one and the one before after. So there's only eight possibilities. You see them like there's nothing, there's something on the right, something in the middle, and so on. So we have uh, eight possibilities uh, so of neighbors. And these eight possibilities, they can lead to either a new cell or cell being enabled or disabled. So we have two to the power of eight possible uh, cellular automatas. Uh, and what it means is when you look at uh, a rule, uh, you look at the number of neighbors, you do a bit shifting by the number of neighbors. Uh, so here it corresponds to zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. So you just do look at the bit corresponding to the number of neighbors, and that gives you if the current cell or the cell should be on or off. Uh, so we'll create a number of cells here. Uh, so yeah, we have a cells count, which is number of rows times calls. Number of cells, which is which is a cells count, and we will start with zeros. And not a const. Uh, we will have a cell uh, current index that tells us where we are. Uh, we can even do start from there. Okay. So now we have just an array of cells. And what I want to do is uh, do the cellular automaton. Uh, I need I need to know the current rule. And for that, I would just again use the time, something like this. And what I need to do also is to know uh, until where I'm going. Uh, so, let's say that we move really fast by number of rows. Oh, my bad, columns. Uh, so, what I want to do now is to generate all the new generation of cells from uh, the current index to the new in next index. So that would be uh, cells at the current index modulo the cells count equals something. And that something is the rule shifted by uh, the combination of the neighbors, this thing here, by the neighbors. And we do AND1 to know if a bit is on or off. Uh, the neighbors are, sorry, here we want to set the next column, the next generation. Uh, and the neighbors are the current index minus one to get the neighbor on the left plus two times the current index plus four times the one on the other side. So we did all this work, and we need to display the, uh, the cell. So I can do a quick thing. Car index. Uh, we can add 16 times the cells position, the current cell. And the current cell, in that case, is x plus y times calls. And I should index for real. Yes. And I can also add some more colors to make it more oh, easier to. Uh, what is happening now is that 
we don't see any of these uh, nice patterns appearing because I started with everything at zero. Uh, it's not, I, I need to also glitch that. Uh, so where I do a cellular automaton, I can create a or get a glitch. And And I glitch that again. So you, you can probably see a bit of a structure appearing in the background. And I will make it more obvious here by getting a list of colors. Color index. And I need index that would be what did I use? Okay. Okay. The color index would be that. It's initially this, but I need to set a list of colors. I'll do that at the beginning. And I will add some more to it. Um, which color did I said before. Mm. So how does it look like? Broken. That's normal because I'm doing something silly. Uh, now that should work. Uh, and let's add um, the current cell to the color. Let's uh, so just take the color index we just added now, which is only based on the pattern, uh, these things that are spinning around. And let's add two times the value in the cell of the current index. So now we see this pattern appearing in the back. Right. Um, should I continue or let's move on? <laughs> hmm? We're out of time? Okay. Too bad. Um, I'm Almost finished. Sorry. I'll extend. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> almost, 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 almost. Sorry. Uh, So something that we, I didn't show you, but uh, this is what the, the performance profiling looks like. Uh, it looks a bit sad. Uh, yeah, you can see uh, at the top in yellow that's the CPU usage. So we are maxing out CPU usage. A bit further down, where it gets a bit colorful with uh, like uh, yellow and light blue and so on, you see some red marks. That means that we are really slow. And further down, you see the, uh, uh, the, the list of a, of a call stack, or basically the, the time spent on the, every function. And we see that what is uh, the top uh, of the worst performance in that case is the call to canvas field text, where we use almost 80% of the time. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you saw a performance profiling. This is terrible. Uh, but in Voltra, uh, I, I managed to do it. I managed to do it to do the visuals, and I also had to generate the sound on the fly. Uh, and doing the sound on the fly is like really super intensive. Uh, so I had to, and all that in one kilobyte, I had to look at for uh, ways to do that. So I tried many ways. I tried to do, uh, to do exactly that with plain HTML and CSS. That was a bad idea. I tried to do that with plain canvas, that was a bad idea. I tried to do that with uh, our canvas and field text. Try to do that uh, with a mix of drawing the text with uh, plain HTML and overlaying a canvas on top of it and using CSS uh, blend modes to apply the color. Bad idea. 
uh, at least for in that context for one kilobyte. Uh, what I ended up doing uh, was to build a sprite sheet from the canvas. I, first, I draw all the characters that I will need, create uh, patterns that I can use as a field style, uh, and that way I could get all the performance black. So uh, here's uh, Turbo, uh, the pet snail of my daughter, Vida. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I saw that, I filed some performance issues with different browser engines. The good news is that they looked at it, uh, and they, they really did look at it. So it's, it's, thank you for that. The bad news is that it turns out that it's not typical use case. Like uh, people don't draw sm thousands of small strings per frame, or, or maybe some people do. You know. <laughs> The, the fine people uh, making this app, uh, they, they were struggling the other day with the uh, performance of a rendering engine. And they, they asked for some help. And uh, the things I learned when doing Voltra uh, allowed me or gave me some really good insights for them. And the, it was really valuable. Uh, so this thing that I made for fun uh, on the side, it just all came together. I, I, I was having fun, but digging a bit deep. and suddenly it became super useful at work. Uh, so if there's one thing I would like you to remember from this talk, uh, is that you should try to give yourself a space without mistakes. Try to get some space or side projects, anything you want, where you can experiment, dig a bit, a bit deeper than you would normally, or in, in aspects of the code or the technology that you would not in your day job. And you will learn a lot, it's super fun, and it might become useful. Uh, and with that, thank you so much for having me. I'm, again, Mathieu Henry. Uh, you can find me on Pizzer or as Pizzer One Online. Thank you so much.